You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 369 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Establishing colonies in North America took an astonishing amount of work. Colonists had to clear the land of trees, which meant felling the trees, and eventually removing tree stumps from the newly cleared fields, planting crops that they could eat and sell, weeding and tending those crops, and then they had to harvest those crops and get the crops they intended to sell to the nearest market town so that they could sell them. And that's just some of the work involved if you want to establish farms in the colonial setting. Now, as you know from listening to this podcast, most colonists did not perform this work on their own. They enlisted the help of children and neighbors, purchased enslaved people, and they used animals. Andre Jeter is the Bill and Jean Lane Director of Coach and Livestock at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. And he joins us today to explore the animals the English, later British colonists brought with them to North America and then used to build, run, and sustain their colonial farms and cities. Now, animals provided many benefits to early Americans. So Andre is also here to share information about some of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's efforts to bring back the population numbers of some of these historic animal breeds through its Rare Breeds program. Now, during our exploration, Andre reveals details about the livestock English colonists brought with them to early North America, as well as the animals they encountered that were indigenous to North America. The work livestock performed on farms and in urban colonial cities like early Williamsburg, Virginia, and information about Colonial Williamsburg's rare breeds program and why a living history museum like Colonial Williamsburg is working to help increase the population numbers of different historic animal breeds. But first, the art museums of Colonial Williamsburg invite you to join them for I Made This, a dynamic conference exploring the lives and work of Black artists and artisans from the 18th to the 21st centuries. This conference will feature keynote lectures by founding members of the Black Craftspeople Digital Archives, Dr. Tiffany Monman and Dr. Torrent Gatson. There will also be an opening dinner and presentation by the James Beard Award-winning author, Michael Twitty, who is the expert behind the Afro-Culinaria Food Blog, a blog dedicated to communicating information about African-American foodways. The I Made This Black Artists and Artisans Conference will take place at the Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg on November 10 and 11, 2023. For more information and to register, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash I made this conference. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash I made this conference. All right, are you ready to explore the uses and types of livestock in early America? Allow me to introduce you to our expert guide. Joining us is the Bill and Jean Lane Director of Coach and Livestock at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Andre Jeter. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? We're doing well. Thank you for asking. And we're really excited to have you here because we love to talk about animals. Now, Andre, you are the Director of the Coach and Livestock Department here at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. And I wonder if you could tell us what your job entails. What are the types of work that you do as the Director of Coach and Livestock? I am over all the animals here at Coach and Livestock. We have about 130 animals here, ranging from horses, cows, chicken, and sheep. I oversee the nutrition program, oversee the training program for the horses to make sure that they are safe out there on the street as we're doing carriage rides for the guests, and then also over the rare breed animals here at Coach and Livestock. When many of us think about animals or livestock, we're perhaps thinking about cows or horses or maybe even just the pet cat and pet dog that we have at our homes. How does the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation define livestock and the different animals that can be part of our livestock? Livestock will be any animal that is dual purpose. So as far as animals as in working animals like your horses or your oxen or animals that we use for food and for clothing. So like you use sheep for wool, also for meat. 
Same thing with your chickens. You use those for meat. You also use those for egg production, but also you use chickens for scratching around in your garden and help weed out your garden and everything. So when we talk about livestock, we're talking about animals that will be used on the farm as part of transportation and as part of productivity for that farm. And then also as a food source to the people that owns that farm. If we think about livestock and its ability to perform dual functions to produce food, materials for clothing, and help out with transportation and labor, I think we can understand that livestock serve many important roles in the history of early America and the early United States. And Elizabeth and Stessa would like to know more about the specific breeds of animals the English colonists brought with them to British North America to serve these dual purposes. So would you tell us about the specific animal breeds that English colonists brought with them from England to British North America? When the English bought animals over here, there wasn't a specific type of breed of animals. There was just animals. You had your cows, you had your chickens, pigs, horses, etc. It was later during the years where they started naming breeds of animals. So they would have bought geese over here. They would have bought horses. They would have bought cows. They would have bought pigs. Sheep, they would have bought over here. So there are different animals that they would have bought over here that they can use as part of their transportation, as part of agriculture and working a farm, and then also as food source. So that's the type of animals that would have been over here. So when did specific breeds come about? Because I've done some research in early America, and I've seen letters between Robert Livingston, who was a huge landowner in New York, and Elkana Watson, who was the founder of our modern agricultural affairs in the United States. And both of those men talk very specifically about the Merino sheep. Now, they are referencing this sheep in the late 1780s, early 1790s, but was identifying specific breeds among animals something that might have started earlier in the 18th century or perhaps in the late 17th century? Or was this really a late 18th century, early 19th century phenomenon? I would say it started in the 18th century. You start getting breeds of horses. Just like if you look at some of the documents when they're talking about horses, they just call them racing horses. They don't really prefer to them as a name. It was later on when they start getting names and saying, hey, this is a thoroughbred. Hey, this is a standard bred. This is a Arabian horse. It had like three or four different types of breed. Your Godolphin, Arabian. So... That would be later on. Now, when the English colonists arrived in North America in 1607, did they find any animals that were indigenous to Virginia that were able to help them with their plans to establish permanent settlements in North America? The only animals that would have been here that have been indigenous would have been deer and turkey. Anything else that wouldn't have been here except for you had your Spanish horses, the horses that wrecked off the coast or what we call our Spanish type horses, kind of like your marsh tackies, like in South Carolina. All of them get different names every time they move up a region. So they would name something different in North Carolina. South Carolina, they call the marsh tackies. You going up the road, they call Chickasaws. Those horses would have been here back in the day. And I suppose those indigenous animals that you mentioned, deers and turkeys, really wouldn't have been all that much help with felling trees and plowing a field. I mean, I've never heard of a working deer <laughs> or a working turkey before. I wouldn't suggest anybody try to turn a deer into a working deer. I mean, I have seen after the 19th century during the gold rush and when people was moving out to rest and stuff like that, and they didn't have enough domesticated animals around them that they start using animals like moose, caribou, so that is a type of deer. So they start using animals like that. It's not uncommon. They could do it, but it will take a lot of time and practice to domesticate those animals to get them to work for you. And as someone who grew up in New Hampshire around moose, I'm just having fun imagining this idea of a working moose. I mean, they're really gigantic and they're not that smart. So those miners would have had their work cut out for them. Now, as we are speaking about working animals, Andre. How did the colonists use the livestock that they imported, or perhaps even the wild horses that they found from Spanish shipwrecks along the coast of British North America? How were they using those animals in their daily lives? Animals was a big deal back then for transportation. So 
You got to get supplies in and out of town. So you have to use horses, oxen for that. You got to clear cut land, cutting trees down. And then you got to log the trees out of there. So you have to have horses, oxen to actually do that and plying the fields too. You had the enslaved that actually plow fields, but you also have horses and oxen too. If you can afford an enslaved person that you use that on the land to help ply and dig up the land as well. I'm glad you brought up horses and oxen, because when I was researching my dissertation on Albany, New York, I found that the Dutch colonists and their descendants had a big preference for big draft horses over oxen when it came to plowing fields and carrying big loads, whereas the New Englanders, their neighbors to the north and east, had a stated preference for oxen. And one of the instances you can see this debate and preference playing out, oxen versus horses, is when Henry Knox has to remove the cannon from Fort Ticonderoga in late 75 and bring that cannon to Boston by March of 1776. So that is a place where New Englanders and New Yorkers were actively arguing whether oxen or big draft horses were the better animal for the job. Andre, did people in southern British American colonies also have preferences for different animals? Was there a similar preference for horses over oxen or oxen over horses? Here in Virginia, you will see oxen that was mostly used, and oxen today are used worldwide. They are the most used animal today, especially in third world countries. Horses is second to that. Oxen are easier to use. They can pull more as far as power, so they can pull three times their weight. The only thing about oxen is that they can't work in hot climates. So when it comes down to hot climate. They are almost like dogs. They don't have no sweat glands, so they paint to cool down. So you can't overwork your oxen. So you have to work them from sun up to the noontime, and then you cut that off, and then everything else will be done by hand. Or you will bring horses in, and you can use horses as well. Most of the draft breed work better up north because they're cold-blooded animals, so they don't like a lot of heat. And they're bigger horses, they're more stout, so they got more power. So you will use those more up north. Here, they will use more smaller size horses. So anything around 14, three horses that they would use back then as far as plowing, carriage riding. And then draft horses really didn't come on the scene until about the 1900s. When we picture an ox in our mind, and you said that it can grow up to pull three times its weight, so it can pull more than a big draft horse. Just how big of an animal are we talking about? How big do oxen get? Oxen can get pretty big. I've seen some bigger, but you can get them up to 2,400 pounds. Most people today, they really don't see steers or oxen. Oxen is a term of word. A cow is a cow when it's out in the pasture, or you got cattle that is out in the pasture while they're grazing. But when they're working, we use the term oxen because they are working animals at that point in time. So. Now you don't see it as much. You go up north, you'll see some oxen competition, all that, but you don't see steers grow that much because most time it's food production. So everybody eat them within a year. So you don't actually see how big they can grow until like you come here, you visit and you actually see the oxen walking down the street and they're like, whoa, that's a big cow. And it's like, yeah, when you give them time to grow, they'll grow pretty big. Now, what about the use of smaller animals? Many of us have cats and dogs that we treat as family members. There are pets, but we also know that these animals can be really good for herding or keeping your horse or ox safe and providing them with companionship. Plus, dogs and cats are also really good at hunting rodents, which can carry diseases that could impact your livestock. So did early Americans also use these smaller animals on their farms and in their lives as work animals? Dogs were used a lot. They used dogs for herding. Also, they use dog as a sport. So just like cop fighting, they use dogs for dog fights. Also using dogs as hunting dogs. They will hunt also. So they will use them for that as well. Dogs, yes. Cats, I believe that cats are not pets. Cats make people pets. <laughs> That's probably a very fair assessment of cats. Now, I think throughout our conversation thus far, many of us have been picturing all the different animals we've been talking about going to work on big rural farms out in the countryside of early America. But here at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, we interpret the capital city of the colony of Virginia, which is and was an urban setting. 
Andre, how did people in early American cities like Williamsburg make use of animals and incorporate them into their daily lives? Well, just like you said, this would have been an urban city area. You wouldn't have had that many farm animals in towns on the outskirts of Winsburg. You would have had farms on the outskirts, but in town, you wouldn't have everything here. You would have seen carriages of your high gentry that's being pulled by horses. You would have seen wagons that have been pulled by horses or oxen that the farmer are bringing supplies in town to trade. And then you would also see those animals here working, like putting up houses or anything like that. That's what you would have pretty much saw here back in the day inside the city. But on the outskirts, you'll see more farmland. So you will see the sheep, you will see the pigs, you see the cows, chickens and other animals like that. So where does someone who lives in a city or who is visiting a city put their carriages and horses at night? Most of your high gentry had a barn on their property behind their houses. And then you look at the taverns that was in town. Your tavern would have had a barn because people come in town, stay at the tavern. And then the tavern realized that not only they housing you, they got to house your animal as well. So your horses will stay at the tavern barn and then you will pay for your horse to board there and also for them to feed the horses oats. Now, sometimes people who lived in colonial cities had kitchen gardens where they had a small garden space behind their urban dwelling. And that's where they grew the food they needed for their kitchen, vegetables, herbs. Would smaller animals have been part of this kitchen gardening, so to speak, and raising your own food to feed your families? Yes. So you would have your high gentry, you had your enslaved that stayed on the property that would have been working what we call the small garden there in the city. They'd be working it for food. Also, they would have had chickens. You can use chickens, geese as like weeder geese. So they go in there and they scratch up the soil and they don't really eat the plants. Plus the manure from the chicken and the geese also add fertilizer to the ground. The middle class, they didn't have enough money to afford an enslaved person that did the work for them. So you'll see the family out there tending to the garden as well that they had behind the house. They would grow greens and different types of vegetables. That was easy to manage. It wouldn't be a big field of light watermelon or growing corn or anything like that. It would have been stuff that they would have ate on a regular basis. And what about the enslaved? When we've heard about plantation life, again, in rural settings where there's enough land for a big plantation, sometimes enslavers allowed enslaved people to keep their own small gardens where they could grow food and perhaps keep a chicken or a goose or two. Was it possible for the enslaved who lived in Williamsburg during the colonial period to also keep and tend a small garden? Some of the owners, they did let them have a garden. They would grow food that they was accustomed to, that they had seeds and stuff that they had grew like they had in Africa. So, yes, but their garden wouldn't be as elaborate as the owner garden because they spend so much time working on their garden when it's sundown and when it's time for them to work on their garden. First, you got an individual that done worked all day and is tired. And then you got an individual that at the end of the day, they trying to feed their family as well. So they garden wouldn't look as good as they gardens. We call those like weed gardens, but those weeds played an important role because enslaved were very resilient as in taking what they had and making it work for their families. One historical aspect we've explored on this podcast is just how disruptive the American Revolution and its war was to the daily lives of those who lived in colonial towns, cities, and even throughout the countryside. And we know that not too far from Williamsburg, the war for American independence raged, first with the Battle of Great Bridge that happened in December 1775, and of course, more famously, with the Siege of Yorktown in 1781. Andre, Did the American Revolution and its nearby battles and sieges impact the lives of Williamsburg's livestock in any way? Do we have any records of the British or American army seizing horses, oxen, and other animals that would have been kept in the city of Williamsburg for their war efforts? Yes, it affected the livestock on both sides. You had the troops on the British side, then you had the Patriots, and they had to feed the troops. So they were taking still animals from these farms, and they would actually take their crops too. 
And so depending on what side that you was on or who you were loyal to made a bit different because if the opposing side came on your farm and you're not for them, then they're going to steal all the rations for the troops. And then because you supported the British, then they will burn your house down, burn your fields and take your animals and then you can't produce no more. So I say war is not friends to anybody. And it don't matter if you're fighting in the war or if you're on the sideline looking in. It is detrimental to both parties and to individuals like the farmers that was around here that had the animals because they didn't get compensated for what they lost. Okay. Now that we have some historical understanding for how colonial Americans used animals, and the different types of animals that they used in their day-to-day lives. I'd like for us to talk about how the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation uses animals in its Living History Museum. But first, let's take a quick moment to thank our episode sponsor. With the busy fall season already in full swing, you might be looking for some wholesome, convenient meals to help keep you and your family running during your jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. It can be really hard to eat healthy when you're always on the go. With Factor, you can skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, all while getting the flavor and nutritional quality that you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready to eat in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Each week, you can choose what you'd like to eat, For more than 35 flavor-packed, fresh, never-frozen meals, they'll help you and your family enjoy a healthy lifestyle and meet all of your meal preferences. And if you're looking to enjoy seasonal flavors such as the autumn flavors of fall, you can enjoy Factor's limited-time, hearty, comforting meals, which feature seasonal vegetables and main courses like cranberry pecan chicken and apple Dijon pork chops, meals that will help satisfy your fall cravings and that are ready to eat in just two minutes. This October, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered straight to your door and ready to eat in just two minutes with no prep and no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash benfranklin50 and use code benfranklin50 to get 50% off. That's code benfranklin50 at factormeals.com slash benfranklin50 to get 50% off. Now, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation began its work in 1926. Andre, when did the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation begin to use animals in its interpretations of 18th century life? Is this something that the foundation has always done since 1926? We have documentations and we get this from the Rockefeller Library that actually in about the 1920s, they were moving houses and they were actually using horses to move houses. Fast forward, if you go into about the 1930s, when they first start toying with the idea of having animals here, they had their first carriage that appeared in the historic area. And it was intended as a vehicle to deliver the costume hosts from their houses to the workplace. So it was just more of you just out there just being seen and just picking up people from their houses and dropping them off so they can go to work. And then later on, it got developed where they start bringing in animals into the historic area. So it'll give it a a feel of colonial Virginia and the type of animals that they would have had here. And then it just involved from there. Wow, that's neat that animals participated in the construction of the original Williamsburg in colonial Virginia and that all these years later, they were participating in the reconstruction of what is now the Colonial Williamsburg Living History Museum. Correct. That's really neat. Now, if you follow the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation on social media, you know that each and every spring, you can be delighted with pictures of the baby lambs who are born here. Andre, what other animals will we find as we walk around the historic area of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation? Do we just have sheep and horses on hand for people to view? We have sheep and horses. We got the Cleveland Bay horse. We got the list along with sheep. We also have red Devon cows, milking cows, and then we also have shorthorn milking cows, which are the oxen. So if you walk around Colonial Winsburg, you will see a representative of these animals throughout the town. And then also we have different chickens at different sites in the historic area as well. So Andre, 
how does the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation go about selecting different breeds of animals that it would like to represent in its historic area or living history museum? You mentioned Cleveland Bay horses and Devon cows, and also how the naming of specific breeds didn't really happen until the late 18th, early 19th centuries. Well, we partner up with the Livestock Conservancy, and we look at animals that the colonists would have bought over during that time period with them. And then these animals are part of our rare breed program. And they don't have to necessarily be here in Colonial Winsburg. We have animals that represent Colonial Virginia, or animals that would have been bought over here by the English settlers. So that's how we determine what animals that we want to bring here. Most of all the animals are usually part of the livestock conservancy, and we know that they're rare. And so we try to bring awareness to these breeds that would have been here in Colonial Virginia and then work on trying to build a population back up. Speaking of building up the population numbers for historic breeds, one of the big initiatives that Andre has been involved with over the years is the expansion of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's efforts to bring back the breed of Cleveland Bay horses. Andre, would you tell us about the Cleveland Bay horse and why it has neared extinction? Cleveland Bay horse, so in England, up in Yorkshire, that's where the horse was originally from. During World War I, these horses were used as artillery horses, and most of them got destroyed during World War I. Queen of England and her grandfather, with the efforts of them to bring the Cleveland Bay back, we know the Queen of England had a stud that she had bought, and she had offered it up to the public, and everybody bred it to the Queen horse, so that brought the Cleveland Bay back. But the Cleveland Bays are animals that were used for like plying, working on a farm for fox hunting, to take your family to church on Sundays. Horses were actually used as vehicles back then because there wasn't cars around there. So horse drawn carriage wagons that would get you around. Now, coming up into like your 21st century, you get automobiles, you got trains, you got everything. So you don't need the horses that much. So these carriage bred animals. They slow growing, slow developing, and now everything is a fast pace. So do you want to take your time and slowly develop a horse or do you want what they got now, like thoroughbreds, like at the age of two, they are like racing? Or do you want to sit there and wait to the age of four or five before you start working a horse so it'll start mentally maturing? So that kind of like phased out. The Cleveland Bays, it's not that many people breeding them. And then, like you say, over time with the rare breed horses, too, you got a little bit of inbreeding. So when you got inbreeding, you got some genetic faults with these animals as well. These things can lead to many health issues or breeding issue as well. And then that'll decline the number down as well. Would you tell us about the foundation's work, your work to bring back the Cleveland Bay horse and A bit about the work you do to develop these horses for a life here in our historic area at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. There's a couple of things that we do here at the foundation when it comes down to breeding the Cleveland Bays. First of all, none of our mares will carry their foal. We use recipient mares. It's a lot of science behind what we do. So we do a lot of embryo transfer. So that's what we take the embryo out of the donor mare and put it in a recipient mare. The Cleveland Bay will be the donor mare. And then we will use recipient mares like off-the-track race horses or thoroughbreds, and they will carry our foes out. That's because we spend a lot of money on the rare breed horses. If we were to actually lose one during its pregnancy, that would set us back a couple of years. That's the first thing that we do, then trying to produce purebreds. The next thing we do in our program is what we call grading. So that's where a horse that's Kind of similar to a Cleveland Bay, we introduce that genetic to Cleveland Bays and we produce a part bred horse. And then when we get up to a three fourth, we get that horse graded through the society. Once that mare is graded through the society, every time that mare has a foal, it grades up until we can get it up to like 15 sixteenths. And then once we breed that one back to a purebred, that will go back in the stud book as a purebred Cleveland Bay. So that's another part of the breed with the Cleveland Bays that we do. We also breed parts because we got to actually fund this program. So we also sell horses to the public. 
so we can help fund this program. We also have donors that donate to the program and the foundation chip and help us with the program. But we got to find other ways to generate income to help pay for the program. And then lastly, we are breeding and producing our own horses for driving program and our riding program. So for our nation builders and our actors interpreters, we try to make sure that we breed horses that are real nice, loose, flexible horses, riding horses in town. And then as same as carriage driving horses, we produce driving horses that we can use in town. Before we was buying our horses for driving and riding, which we still do, but we're trying to switch over and produce the horses that we need right here and then raise them up and train the horses and have them out in the historic area. So everybody can see that our program is doing quite well and that we actually breed our horses here. We actually train our horses here. And then the product is when the guests come in town, they can actually see these horses out on the street performing. And everybody always come up to me and say, oh, man, your horses are just so nice. That comes to we take our time to develop our horses. We're not like showing horses where we got to have horses turned out for showing. We actually take our time to actually develop that horse and put that horse in what that horse is good at. So if that horse is good at being a riding horse, it would be a riding horse. That horse good at being a carriage horse, then it'll be a carriage horse. And sometimes we have horses that can do both. We can ride and drive. That's a little bit of our breeding program with our Cleveland Bays. And it sounds like each Cleveland Bay that we have in the historic area serves as a tool for Colonial Williamsburg to raise more awareness about the breed and the rare breeds program here. Correct. As an organization, we can't do it by ourselves. We know that other organizations that wish to partner in with us as far as helping us with this crusade of saving the Cleveland Bay and getting the number back up, because we know that this breed is critical. There's less than a thousand in the world. The Livestock Conservancy, I believe they said that a total of 200 horses need to be registered every year to get this horse out of being critical to being threatened. We produce around 10 foals a year here. So it's going to take a lot of efforts of different organizations, private individuals that breed Cleveland Bay to help get that population back up, especially North America, Canada. We would need more people helping and breeding more Cleveland Bay. But to bring awareness to these animals is crucial because most people don't know about the Cleveland Bay or never heard of the Cleveland Bay. And like I say, these animals are about to be extinct. So here as Colonial Winsburg, we have the opportunity because we are one of the largest outdoor living museum in North America where people can actually come. They can actually see the horse here and they can actually touch and feel the horses and pet the horses and know that coming here and paying for day passes, that that funds the program and help take care of the horses and all the animals here, but also help us with breeding the horses as well to keep that population and that number up. Andre, you mentioned earlier that part of the process of breeding these horses is to get them graded. Would you please explain the grading process for us and what that terminology means for those of us who are unfamiliar with horse breeding? I know it's kind of confusing. I'll break it down. So what we actually do is just say we don't have enough of purebred mares, which we don't. When I first took over the program, we only had two purebred mares. So I know in order to get numbers up, we got to get more purebred mares. So the next step is grading. So what I went around and did was look for mares that was part bred. So part bred mares are what we call three-fourths mares. So they 75% Cleveland, 25% of some other breed, whether it be thoroughbred, Hanoverian, whatever. So we'll take them mares and Cleveland Bay Society have different rules that we got to go by in order to have this mare put into that grading program. So she have to check everything off the box. She's got to look like a Cleveland Bay have black mane and point, very little to no white at all, except for like a little dime piece on the forehead. So what we do is, for instance, we'll take a half-bred horse. So it can be half Cleveland Bay, half thoroughbred. That mare has a filly. That filly becomes a three-fourths. So that's like 75% Cleveland Bay. And then what happened is that filly will get graded. So we'll go from just being a part-bred horse to a grade C. And then when that mare has a offspring, 
that offspring automatically get graded to a grade B. If it's a mare, if it's a coat, it'll go to a grade D, but it'll get moved up to a grade B, which is seven eighths. So that's 88% Cleveland Blade bloodline. And then we'll take the offspring of that one, which will be another mare and breed it to a purebred Cleveland. And then we'll get that to a 15 sixteenths, which is 94% bloodline of Cleveland Bays. And we'll just keep that same play and we'll keep going that route until we get a like 31, 32. And that'd be 97% Cleveland Bay. So that means that horse will go back into the stud book as a purebred. And it's only got like 3% blood of another horse. And we put in strong genetic horses in there. So then that takes out some of genetic faults. That takes out some of the issues that you have when you got purebred. Some purebreds, just because revolution of breeding, they can be acceptable to parasites. So if you put the other bloodline in there, then it cuts down on that. So that's less worming that you have to do with your part bread, but it's got enough bloodline in there that is considered a purebred and then goes back in the stud book as a purebred. So from that lineage, we started out with a part and then we ended up with a purebred. And how long does it take our program to go from a part bred horse to a purebred horse? Something like from a 75% horse to a 31 32nd. Every time a mare have a fold and you hoping that it's a filly, right? So you got to think about every three years. So every three years you got to wait because we start breeding horses at the age of three or at the age of four. So every three to four years, you got to wait for that mare to get mature and then you breed it. And then you hope that she has a filly. If she don't have a filly, she has a coat. Then you got to wait the next year, breed her back and then hope she have a filly. Then you wait three years, then you wait three years, then you wait three years until you get back to a purebred status. So it's very lengthy. This is a long term process. You mentioned that once the Cleveland Bays are born, you and your team set about developing these horses, that you try to find out what this horse's purpose is in life, whether it's to pull a carriage or to be a riding horse. What kind of work goes into developing the horses that are born here at Colonial Williamsburg? How do you find a horse's purpose? Over at our bypass facility, we have two grooms over there. That's what they do. They specialize in taking care of the mares and foals. So just putting your hands on the foal, just getting the foal acclimated to humans, halter breaking the horses, just walking them, putting them on and off the trailer, getting them used to riding on the trailer, picking their feet up, having the vet to come touch them. The biggest advantage that we got here in Colonial Williamsburg is that we got the pastures throughout the historic area. So we can put a mare and foal in there and the guests can take some of that work away from us. So as the mare approached the fence and the foal approached the fence and people taking pictures and they putting their hands out there and patting them and everything, the foal come up there and they get used to people. And we are imprinting them horses so they'll be friendly around people. Once we get the basic down, they picking up their feet for the farrier. Vets come and check them. We don't have no issues with that. We got them halter braid. We got them where we can clip. We can tie them up in the trailer. We can body clip them. We can do anything, give them shots for their vaccination, all that stuff. Once we got all that, we give them a little time to be horses out in the field, and then we'll bring them back in and then just work with them a little bit, maybe a little bit of round pin work, then we'll put them back out in the field. And then we look at them and see how they develop and how they moving. And depending on how they moving and whatever, like we put these horses together, they'll be a good carriage pair of horses. And then at that point in time, we'll decide, you know, we're going to break it to ride. Then we'll go ahead and start ground working the horse. You'll see us ponying horses through the historic area, walking horses through the historic area so they can get used to their surrounding. And then we start ground driving horses in the round pen. And then you'll see us out there actually ground driving horses throughout the historic area around people. And that draws attention, too, because then people say, oh, y'all training the horses. We can let them know that. We train these are the young future horses that's coming up for the riding and driving program. And then we'll start working them. And then it's just all about just putting miles on them. So it's just repetition, 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 riding that horse or driving that horse until we think that the horse is safe enough to be out there on the street to do its job. We've talked a lot about Cleveland Bay horses and their development. And my understanding is that the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation actually has seven different breeds and types of animals in our rare breeds program. 
So would you tell us about the other animals that Colonial Williamsburg is working to bring back from near extinction? So we have our Lester Longwood sheep. And actually, the Lester Longwood sheep was extinct here in the United States. And due to the efforts of Colonial Williamsburg getting a satellite flock from New Zealand and bringing them both here and breeding them, we have got them from being a state to threaten. So that's part of our robbery program is we keep working at it and we got that population back up. We also have our Red Devon milking cows. We're now working on the Red Devon to get that population back up and get our breeding program where it need to be as far as that. Also, we have different breeds of chickens here. We have our Dominique chickens here. We also have our Nankins here. We have Darkins here. And then we have our old English game fowl what we would call fighting cop. And we would take them out and show them around and talk about cop fighting back in the day because it was a sport and it was big back in colonial times. So we do talk about that. And then we just got a new breed of chicken in called Crevcore. So they are French bred chicken that the colonists would have bought over here. They was known as dual purpose chickens for meat. They said the meat tastes real good because they have real good dark meat. And for the egg production, so we have bought those chickens in as well, and they are considered critical and about to be extinct as well. So with our chickens, we do sell hatching eggs. So when we get our chickens, we produce enough eggs. People that want that type of breed of chicken, we can sell them hatching eggs. We do work with some hatcheries. That's that rare breed chickens, and we work with them as well. If we don't have enough eggs to hatch out, that we can buy the baby chicks for them and raise them up to start another flock here. One of the exciting new projects that we have at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation is the construction of the brand new Randolph Stables. These stables will be a place where you can come and easily see and learn more about the animals we have here at Colonial Williamsburg and a place where you can even give them a pet if that's something you would like to do. It's always something I'd like to do, so maybe it's something you'd like to do too. Andre, Would you tell us more about these stables and when they'll be open to the public? We know on the Frenchman map that the Randolph Stable did exist, and we're going to re-erect the Randolph Stable and build it. But we are excited that we have a central location where we can actually talk about the rare breed animals. In the past, we do our rare breed talk. It's about an hour. We usually do it on Mondays and Thursdays at the Randolph property. Now we're going to have a site that is dedicated to the rare breed animals where guests can come and see the different breeds of animals that we got here. And it's in one central location so we can educate the guests on the different animals. And then the guests, when they come here, they can actually see all the animals that we breed here. Not every animal is going to be here because we got about 130 some animals here, but we will have a representation of the animals in the rare breed program at that site where we will be able to interpret to the guests five to seven days a week. And before we move into the time warp, Andre, I'm curious why you think it's important for living history museums like the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation to have livestock programs. How do you think these historic livestock animals help us better understand the histories and stories of early America? We know animals was a big part of the colonies back in the day. Uh, You take away the animals, you take away the horses, you take away the cows, you take away sheep, wool production, people are going to freeze to death. You take away the food source, they don't have nothing to eat. If they don't learn how to live off the land and go hunt for like deer, turkey, fish, then at that point in time, you're just to the point where you're running out of food source. So these animals play an important role in helping scope and help developing all these colonies here for the English settlement. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. And this time more question comes from Stessa. In your opinion, how might early America have been different if European colonists had never brought domesticated animals to North American shores? It'd be very different. What you see today, you wouldn't have with transportation. You couldn't get supplies up and down the roads. 
or get supplies up and down the river without animals, without oxen, without horses. So just not having oxen and not having horses, vastly, it would have been different. Totally different landscape. That's like asking the question, if the enslaved people was not here, how would the world be? <laughs> it'd, be it'd be vastly different because you're looking at folks that own animals, but didn't really know how to work the animals. And now these animals play an important role in travel, in road, in um, what we call civil engagement, ingenuity, because these horses got to get people back and forth for the House of Burgesses to meet. You know, these people just don't stay just right around here. So you got to get here somehow. And just like I say, these animals are very important in developing what we call today America. I imagine that some of us are now in the midst of planning our trips to Colonial Williamsburg. Andre, what should we know about visiting and touring the Colonial Williamsburg stables? We do a behind the scene tour. So you can come here and purchase a ticket. That ticket goes towards helping feed the animals and the care of the horses. So we do a behind the scene tour. Any time that you come behind the scenes, there are different things that's happening behind the scene that you can tour. So sometimes you can see the farrier here shoeing the horses on Tuesday and Thursday. We also have a horse masseuse here. So like on Wednesday, you could come down and you can see the horses getting their massage. So yes, we do pamper our horses here. And then we have our vets here. So you can see the horses getting their vaccinations or getting their teeth floated. Yes, they do do dental work on horses too. And we also have a chiropractor that comes down and adjusts the horses too. So when people come down here and do behind the scene tours, we have a lot of stuff going on. I mean, some days it's quiet, but most times we usually have stuff going on here that they normally wouldn't see if they just walking around in the historic area. So I would advise everybody, if you can come down here to see what goes on on a daily day basis, get a ticket and come on down there. We'd love to have you. In fairness to the horse masseuse and horse chiropractor, Colonial Williamsburg's horses really work hard. I've seen them around the historic area, pulling their wagons or carrying nation builders around the historic area. So. I think that they deserve a little extra pampering. <laughs> yeah. Andre, what other animal-related experiences can we enjoy and partake in aside from this behind-the-scenes tour? So just walking in the historic area, horses being at the hitching post, we encourage people to go up and ask the driver if they can take a picture with the horse or if they can pet the horse. So you can see that. Throughout the historic area, we have different pastures. So you'll see sheep throughout the pasture. You'll see lambs during that time. We have our baby calves that we have out there in the pasture. So just going through, you're looking at the gardens, and then you look at the animals, and then you come in, and then you can tour some of the historical sites. And what about those of us who, for whatever reason, cannot make it to Tidewater, Virginia, and Williamsburg? Does the Rare Breeds Program have any other virtual or online exhibits or information that we can access? from wherever we're located? You can go to the Colonial Winsburg website and then you can click on Coaching Livestock and it'll tell you about our carriage operation and it'll tell you about our rare breed program as well. And is the Colonial Williamsburg website also the best place to look for more information about Coaching Livestock and its work in general? That is the place to go. Not unless you want to go to the Rockefeller Library and do some research and they will have more information there. Probably in the future, we'll be working on having more stuff online for people that are not able to come that they can easily pull up online and access. Andre Jeter, thank you so much for taking the time to take us through the roles of livestock in early America and through the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's Rare Breeds Program. We really enjoyed ourselves. Thank you for having me. Livestock made the colonization of North America possible. As we heard Andre reveal, Colonists used large animals like oxen and horses for transportation as a way to move supplies in and out of colonial cities like Williamsburg and as helpers on the farm and in building urban infrastructure. Smaller animals likewise also help colonial settlers. Whether on the farm or in the back of a city housing lot, chickens and geese weeded gardens and fertilized soil, while sheep provided the wool that colonists turned into warm thread, yarn, and cloth. And as we all know, All of these little helpers in the gardens, fields, and cities also provided important and valuable food sources for hungry colonists. As Andre stated, if we took away the work and sustenance provided by livestock in the early American period, then we'd be living in a very different world today. Because without the work and sustenance provided by animals, 
early American colonists would have frozen even more than they did during the Little Ice Age. They would have starved more as they decimated local wildlife and fish populations. And they would have found it a lot harder to clear land in farm fields and raise barns, houses, and other buildings. It is partly because horses, cows, chickens, geese, and sheep did so much for early Americans that the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation is trying to help restore the population numbers of some historic breeds with its Rare Breeds program. Helping Red Devon cows, Cleveland Bay horses, Leicester Longwold sheep, as well as different varieties of geese and chicken grow their population numbers not only seems like the right thing to do for these animals that kept early Americans alive, but bringing back these breeds that we know early Americans would have brought with them to North America also enables us to better understand the personalities of these animals, how they worked, and what it was like for early Americans to work with them. And this knowledge of working and observing these animals creates a working knowledge that is similar to the knowledge that we glean from performing trade crafts with historical tools and traditional methods. Both types of working knowledge really help us to better understand the life, work, and experiences of early America. Look for more information about Andre Jeter, Colonial Williamsburg, and its coach and livestock department, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 369. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoyed Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Joseph Edelman, Katie Schinnebeck, Ashley Bachnight Claybrooks, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, I'm going to let you in on a little surprise for listening this far. Next Tuesday, we will offer you an extra episode of Ben Franklin's World in honor of Halloween. So make sure you're following Ben Franklin's World in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss our Halloween special. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. <laughs>